very happy to be with you this morning and in fact for this weekend here at Holy Rosary Parish and I thank Father Paul for your gracious welcome as I come to speak about something very very important and very dear to my heart and I think to the heart of Catholics throughout our nation today we listened in the gospel story as people were coming to John the baptizer and they were hoping that he would be the one, he would be the Messiah, he'd be the one who'd answer their questions about what's the purpose of life anyway. We work and we work and we work and we lose everything. This one takes it, the government takes it, enemies take it. Everything we do, it just seems to slip through our fingers. Are you the one who's going to help us? They were wondering what was going to be the point of their life. If God was going to be always, always punishing them, was there any hope? Is there any sacrifice that we could offer that would take away the sins of the world for all time? Are you the one? Are you the one? They were so eager. And in the desert, where everything is just taken away, they had nothing left. Are you the one who will bring hope? And John, who is the prophet, said, No, not me. I am only human. I'm just a man. You need to go to God who sent his only son, God and man, two natures, two natures, divine and human. There is the Lamb of God. There is the one you must follow. And John the Baptist points to Jesus and say, he has the truth. He has the freedom. He has the way. He will show you how to live. And today on the Feast of the Baptism, we hear that beautiful gospel wherein Jesus steps into the water and the Holy Spirit descends and the voice of God is heard. We know that when we studied about baptism, we, were to we asked the question, what is baptism? What does baptism do? Baptism washes away original sin, makes us children of God, heirs of heaven, inheritors of heaven. That means we live on after we die in this world. You ever read the obituaries? Father Jason reads them to me every morning. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. He goes through and he says, oh, here's one. Here's one. Oh, I knew this one. Oh, here's one. Father Jason, first cup of coffee and this is what we're doing. <laughs> and you know what we, we see time and time again? Well, many times people who really would have had mass if it were up to them, the family says, well, we'll just have a service. And also a celebration of the person's life. We're going to have a celebration of the person's life. But you know what that means? That means their life on earth before they died. And they're throwing out volume two. The life begins with eternal life. When we close our eyes in this world, we open them up in the next. And God calls us to life. But these poor people are celebrating the life past with joys and sorrows and not celebrating the life of eternal joy in Christ because they've been following so many other things, voices out there that tell us this and tell us that. And they say, oh, that sounds nice. We'll do that. Baloney. I mean, if that's all there is, and let me tell you, how many times do we, we look and we see that our young people, our wonderful young people filled with promise and tomorrow and all these wonderful things, their idols, they're told, you know, oh, this one is successful, this one is successful, this one is successful, and they try to be like them. I did it myself. You should have seen my long hair when the Beatles were first coming out. <laughs> I have pictures. They're disgusting. What were we thinking? But the idea is they are put before us, and you can't help but want to follow them. You just can't help it. 
But then what do we see? This poor one is in rehab how many times? This poor one, a marriage, a marriage, a marriage. This poor one, well, they got together, they had children, but they don't know how many or where they are. This poor one is suffering terribly, and they have to work and work and work to portray some kind of an image. And do you know what they probably do when nobody's looking? They probably go into the bathroom and take the biggest towel they can find and cry their eyes out. Why don't they leave me alone? Why don't they let me live? Why can't I have friends? Why can't I find? Just like in the gospel, the people who went to John, are you the one, are you the one, are you the one? I'm desperate, please help me. And what did John do? That is what we must do. You can only go to him. God who became man and entered into our life. We celebrate his life from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. We must celebrate our lives on earth and in heaven. Am I right? Right. Now, what we find is, what we find is many, many times, Education is the most important thing. Now, I was looking around, and I found this. And I'll tell you where I found it, but not yet. Listen to this. Ready? Okay. Put your thinking caps on. I got mine on. <laughs> oh, I'm a disgrace, ain't I? <laughs> Listen to this. Popular education has always been a chief object of the church's care. In fact, it's not too much to say that the history of civilization and education is a history of the church's work. The church holds that the beauty of truth, the refining and elevating influences of knowledge, are meant for everybody. Knowledge enlarges our capacity both for self-improvement and for promoting the welfare of our fellow man. And in so noble a work, the church wishes every hand to be busy. Knowledge, too, is the best weapon against pernicious errors. It is only a little learning that's a dangerous thing. In days like ours, when error is so pretentious and aggressive, everyone needs to be as completely armed as possible with sound knowledge. Not only the clergy, but the people also, that they may be able to withstand the noxious influences of popularized irreligion. In the great coming combat between truth and error, between faith and agnosticism, an important part of the fray must be borne by the laity, and woe to them if they are not well prepared. And if in the olden days, the Middle Ages, for example, if in the olden days the church honored every individual, no matter how humble his position, and labored to give him or her the enlightenment that would qualify him for future responsibilities, much more now, in the era of popular rights and liberties, when every individual is an active and influential factor in the body politic, the church desires that all should be fitted by suitable training for an intelligent and conscientious discharge of the important duties that fall upon them. Now, few, if any, would deny that a sound civilization must depend upon sound popular education. But education, in order to be sound and to produce beneficial results, must develop what is best in man and make him not only clever, but good. 
A one-sided education will develop a one-sided life. And such a life will surely topple over. And so will every social system that is built upon such lives. True civilization requires that not only the physical and intellectual, but also the moral and religious well-being of the people should be promoted, and at least with equal care. Take away religion from a people, and morality would soon follow. Morality gone, even their physical condition will degenerate, while their intellectual attainments would only serve as a light to guide them to deeper depths of vice and ruin. A civilization without religion would be a civilization of the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest, in which cunning and strength would become substitutes for principle, virtue, conscience, and duty. This was written in 1907, over a hundred years ago, over a hundred years of Catholic education. But it sounds like it was written just yesterday. The same struggles are there. But think about what happened. This was written in 1907, just about the time that the Bolshevik Revolution was taking over in Russia and communism, atheistic communism, was coming in and was going to sweep through all of Eastern Europe. And we were becoming ready for that because we knew what communism would be. We knew what anti-religion would be. And we strengthened our Catholic schools to be able to withstand that onslaught. Just think, the First World War, the Second World War, when people were asked to do without, to sacrifice, men and women going overseas, men and women here at home, and families, gas rationing, sugar rationing, meat rationing, all that sort of stuff. But people were willing to do it because they knew this was their duty. We had to pull together. We had to do what was best for each other. Even if it were uncomfortable for me, I got to do it for the good of our life, our nation, and our freedom. Catholic schools were being built and strengthened. And on many, many cornerstone, what did it say beside Anno Domini, year of our Lord? It said, pro Deo et pro Patria, for good for God and for country. For God and for country. Inseparable. When religion is taken away, morality begins to fade, and people say, well, I don't want to do that. Well, it's for me. What's good for me? Turn on any talk show, opinion show. What do they do? It's all, well, what's good for me? How I feel. Not that there's anything right or wrong. They'll put away the right if it makes them uncomfortable. They'll ignore the wrong if it makes them uncomfortable. And if their argument isn't strong enough, they'll shout you down. That is why we must be able to form our people from kindergarten and pre-K right through eighth grade, high school, college, and our adult lives. When we as adults have to face strong issues, our formation in the faith has to be as strong so that we can speak the truth and don't have to get red in the face or jump around like I'm doing now. But to speak the truth that people simply cannot turn away from without shame. <coughs> so it is. I'm here this weekend to tell you, as Father Paul prepared last week, I am committed to doing everything I possibly can for our Catholic schools in the Diocese of Manchester. And in particular, I am here to be strengthening and working with and trying to pull together all our forces to strengthen and encourage attendance at, building for, strengthening, and supporting St. Elizabeth Seton School right here in Rochester. 
I know it's expensive and we got to bring the tuitions down and I am out there looking for and we are garnering support, hoping that people will be able to help us and to endow us and to be able to bring tuitions down. The more people we have coming into the school, the lower the tuition because we're able to share the load and share the burden and keep things going strong. Generation after generation, I've been meeting people, third generation going to St. Elizabeth Seton School. What a wonderful testimony. But I know it's not easy. I know it's a sacrifice. So we're going to do the very, very best we can to help ease that burden. And we are getting a team of people to pray, and we're going to pray our brains out. Because we've been baptized. We entered into the waters with Jesus. And when the waters were poured upon us in our own baptism, and when we were anointed with the chrism, and the Holy Spirit descended upon us and consecrated us and said, you are set apart. And the Holy Father in heaven said, now you are my beloved child. Baptism washes away original sin, makes us children of God and heirs of heaven. So we must do now what Jesus himself did. He must point the way to the Father. And when people were in bad situations by their choice, he would say, your faith has saved you. Now give up this sin. He showed them new life and was able to say, you know that was wrong. Don't do that anymore. And he took upon himself the sins of us all. Our Catholic schools are allowed to say that in the classroom. Our Catholic schools are allowed to open the door to let God in. So we're going to do the very, very best we can 1907 to 2013 and way beyond. Let's do this work and let us indeed give glory to God. Amen. 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 Before the blessing and dismissal, just very briefly, to send to you a greeting that I received this morning at 8.43. That was from Father Jason. He's away on vacation right now, the rat. And <laughs> at the last Mass, just as Father was putting the Blessed Sacrament back in the tabernacle after communion, I felt very strongly. I said, oh, let me just say a prayer. And I said a prayer for Father Jason, because we're remembering him this weekend. And only moments later, I got an email from him. Every now and again, God wins. Yeah. <laughs> so Father Jason expre expresses and sends to you his very, very deepest prayer and affection, remembering you well, hoping that this weekend went well, which indeed it did. Father Jason, as you know, has been doing wonderful work in the vocations office, in the liturgy office, and he has now so many young men to be responsible for. We have one young man who's going to be ordained a priest, God willing, in June, another to be ordained a deacon in June. We also have a man in first theology, second theology, third and fourth theology. We have a man in first year of college, seminary college. So he is doing a splendid, splendid job in helping people to listen to God's call and guiding them through, pointing the way to him indeed. So we're very proud and grateful. Now next week I'll be over at St. Mary's and I'll be going to celebrate Mass also at St. Peter's. And then what we're going to do is next Sunday afternoon, next week at 2 o'clock, we're going over to St. Elizabeth Seton School. We're going to have benediction at 2 o'clock. And we are going to the Blessed Sacrament, and we are going to plant as if we are planting a flag saying, I claim this territory for Jesus Christ, asking the Lord to bless the work that we are doing and to continue the work of Christian education, Catholic education, throughout our land and especially in our diocese. So we hope to see you there. And please pray, please indeed, continue the wonderful work you're doing here at Holy Rosary. God bless you all.
Now the Lord be with you. And with your your spirit. spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go forth. The Mass is ended. Thanks be to God. God. Our sending forth song this morning is number 584 in your music issue, They'll Know We Are Christians. We are one. 